does sunlight help prevent Alzheimer's? To some extent, yes, um, in that um, it improves your vitamin D levels and hypovitaminosis D, which so many of us suffer from, uh, very, very common throughout the world, is one of the risk factors uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And actually vitamin D receptor SNPs are associated with Alzheimer's as well. So no question, vitamin D signaling, and this, and this affects hundreds of genes, among those genes that are important for synaptogenesis and synaptic maintenance. So to some extent, yes, uh, sunlight helpful, at least through the vitamin D. And of course, I think it's helpful just through impacting our depression and things like that as well. So yeah, for those reasons, yes. Are there nutritional supplements that we should use or avoid to prevent Alzheimer's? Right. The whole issue of nutritional supplementation, another very controversial area. And there's been a lot of criticism. And I think, you know, fair criticism to some extent, because people say, hey, these people making supplements are making these ridiculous claims. You know, you take my one supplement, you're going to be a genius. Uh, it's going to reverse your Alzheimer's. Of course, that's ridiculous. Again, we can see we, have the, we can see through the neurochemistry what it actually ch uh, takes to change synaptic maintenance, to change synaptogenesis and to change synaptic maintenance, to increase your synaptoblastic activity and decrease your synaptoclastic activity. Once you understand for each person what's driving that, of course, there's a number of supplements different for each person that will be supportive. So some people, as you mentioned earlier, vitamin D, some people need to support their vitamin D, just as we do for better outcomes for COVID-19. Um, enhancing your ketosis, you can do that with some supplementation. Uh, magnesium, another one, nice publications from uh, Dr. Guo Song Lu from MIT uh, on magnesium, three and eight, using that to support your magnesium levels. Whole coffee fruit extract, good way to enhance your, uh, your BDNF levels, which are also supportive. So again, there are dozens of things that are critical for optimal neurochemistry and supplements. Now, please remember they're called supplements because they're supplementary. There are, there are other things we need to do as well. So this idea of take this one supplement and you're gonna be a genius is ridiculous. But for targeted neurochemistry, absolutely. And anyone who's not taking advantage of the support that are given by supplements and by other things like brain training, each of these things by themselves, not particularly helpful, small amounts of help. But when you have the whole orchestrated and targeted protocol, you get much better results than people have seen before. So in that sense, yes, there are a number of these um, that can be very helpful. And curcumin, I mean, we could go on and on. There are all sorts of things that have, you know, anti-inflammatory effects, uh, SPMs um, that help resolve inflammation, so helpful. A number of things that can be helpful for uh, insulin sensitivity. Creating insulin sensitivity is so important. Uh, when we would grow uh, neurons in Petri dishes to study them and to study their degeneration, uh, we would always have to include insulin in there because insulin signaling is an important trophic impact on neurons. So if you've got insulin resistance, you are hurting yourself. And there are a number of things that can improve that. Uh, you know, th even things like a chromium picolinate uh, and things like, um, uh, like bergamot as another example. And there are many things, uh, the, you know, cinnamon even, things like this that, that can all be helpful for insulin sensitivity. Uh, so yes, absolutely the right ones in the right way with the right manufacturer so they're not giving you garbage, which is another thing that's unfortunately hurt the whole field. So we have to all do better to make sure that these things are top quality and that are, are approaching and directing themselves against the neurochemistry for each of us that is critical for best outcomes. Are there any people that are at greater risk for Alzheimer's? Uh, what age, sex, race, and part of the world you live in puts you at a greater or lower risk? Yeah, and again, you can go right back to this equation looking at the synaptoblastic and synaptoclastic signaling. So anything that affects those subtypes that we talked about, 
anything that gives you inflammation, anything that gives you glycotoxicity and insulin resistance, anything that is a reduction in support for the brain, anything that reduces the energetics for the brain, anything that is enhancing trauma, those things are all at risk. So as we age, because remember, it's integrating over time. You're looking at this. If you've got good synaptoblastic activity, great. When you drop below that, you're downsizing. So downsizing over years is what's giving you Alzheimer's disease. So ongoing systemic inflammation, absolutely. Greater age. Groups that unfortunately, just as we've seen with COVID-19, um, the whole you know, health disparities, that is an issue. If you have uh, if you have poor vascular support, you have more vascular disease. So yes, it is true that your risk is increased in an, an African-American group versus a non-African-American group. There is an increased risk. There is an increased risk uh, in a Latino group as well. Uh, and uh, which is not to say that anyone has, has no risk, no question. And then of course the genetic risk is a big one. Um, and the, the most common genetic risk, and there are dozens of genes that, that increase risk, but the most common one is called ApoE4. And so your apolipoprotein E, most of us have either, so two, three, or four. So for example, I checked myself, I'm a 3-3, three, three, which is the most common, that's like vanilla. If you have no copies of ApoE4, and that's about three quarters of the population, your lifetime risk is about 9%, not zero, but not terribly high. If you have a single copy, and that's 75 million Americans, then your risk during your lifetime about 30%. If you have two copies, and that's about 7 million Americans, your lifetime risk is well over 50%. Most likely you will develop Alzheimer's. And therefore, we'd like to get everybody to find out their status, get on prevention, and let's make it so that these people don't have to worry. And there's a wonderful website, apoe4.info. There are over 3,000 people, all apoe4 positive, sharing information. The vast majority of them are on some variation of our protocol and doing very, very well. So there is a tremendous amount you can do. And absolutely, there's all sort of risk factors. I mentioned earlier things like, um, and these things are you know, very different. They don't make sense unless you understand that that's signaling. So people with low vitamin D, people uh, who have low testosterone, low estradiol, uh, postmenopausal without uh, BHRT, without hormone replacement, if you had an early oophorectomy, that's a nice study out of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, people with uh, insulin resistance, with type two diabetes, uh, people with obesity, uh, all of these things, all these different risk factors, all feed into those same subtypes. Um, people with any degree of vascular disease, so high uh, triglyceride to HDL ratio, for example, high HSCRP, high homocysteine, poor detox apparatus. These things are all contributing to that same fundamental change. 